everybody. I'm so glad you're a part of this small group study of God's plan and God's promises for seven key areas of your life. Now, in the next seven sessions, we're going to be looking at God's promises for your spiritual health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your relational health, your financial health, and your vocational health. I call these the seven key areas of life. Now, God cares about every area of your life, and he wants to bless you in every area of your life. He wants you to be healthy in body and in soul and in spirit. And he has given us the steps and the principles in his word that we can take to live healthy, fulfilling lives, not just for our happiness, but ultimately for God's happiness and for his glory. You know, God's word is filled with his promises to bless every area of our lives. But with all of God's promises, there's always a premise. Did you hear that? With every promise, there's a premise. God says, if you do this, that's the premise, then I will do this. That's the promise. For instance, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, that's the premise, he will forgive our sins. That's the promise. The Bible says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. That's the premise. And the Bible says, he will direct your path. That's the promise. Every promise has a premise. Now, over the next seven sessions, we're going to look at God's promises for each of these seven key areas of life. And we're going to discuss the premises or the conditions or the steps that we can take in order to live in God's blessing. Now, in this session, we're going to look at seven habits that will improve your spiritual health. We're going to start with your spiritual health. God has promised that if you practice these seven habits, and they're all out of Scripture, He will bless you with strong spiritual health. So let's just start with the habit number one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, number one, I must love Jesus supremely. I must love Jesus supremely. That's a habit. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this. If you want to be my followers, you must love me more than you love your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Now that sounds pretty radical. But he says, otherwise than that, you cannot be my disciple. Now what's he saying here? He's saying that you must love me, Jesus, more than anything else. Now, I want you to write this down. Spiritual health is measured by love. Spiritual health is measured by love. Write that down. Spiritual health is measured by how much you love. It's not measured by how much you know. It's not measured by your Bible knowledge. It's not measured by your skills. It's not measured by the words that you say, or it's not measured by how much you attend church. Your spiritual health is measured by how much you love, how much you love God and how much you love others. That's what Jesus said. In fact, in Mark 12, Jesus says this, the most important commandment is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's passionately and all your soul. That's willfully and all your mind, that's thoughtfully. And with all your strength, that means love him practically. Live like you love him. Now, there's a word for this in the Bible, loving God. It's called worship. Whatever you love the most in life is what you worship. If you love your boat the most, you worship your boat. If you love your job the most, you worship your job. If you love your body the most, you worship yourself. If you worship whatever, uh, you, whatever you give your best love to is what you worship. And God says this, if you want to be spiritually healthy, you got to love me the most. Worship me supremely. That's the first habit for spiritual health. Habit number two, you might write this down. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must meet with him, that's God, daily. I must meet with him daily. It could just be five minutes a day or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever, but you make a date with God. You get alone with God and you just sit there and you be quiet and you say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? And as you talk to God in prayer about the things that are on your mind, then you let God talk to you through his word. That's, that's worship. And that's a quiet time. Now, the Bible says this in Proverbs 8:34. Blessed is the man who listens to me watching daily. Circle the word daily watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. What is God saying there? He's saying, I want you to have a daily appointment, a daily habit of meeting with me. Now think about this. Why would God want you to spend time with him every day if he didn't want to spend time with you every day? Do you realize that? The God of the universe wants to spend time with you. This is important to God. 
He always shows up for his appointment. Do you? If you study church history, you find that every great believer, everybody who's ever been super blessed, super used of God, has had this habit of meeting with God on a daily basis. Again, it doesn't have to be long, but it does have to be habitual. You need to check in with God. Now, here's habit number three for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must study and do his word. I just can't study it. I've got to study and do his word. Now, there are so many promises in the Bible where God says, if you get this book, the Bible, you get this book into your heart and into your mind, he says, I will bless your business. I will bless your family. I will bless your health. I will bless your finances. If you get this book into you and into every area of your life, wherever you want God to bless, you need to build it on the Bible. Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. By the way, what is the law of the Lord? It's this, it's the Bible. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And the Bible says, if you do that, that's the, prom, that's the premise. Here's the premise. It says, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. In other words, you're going to be more productive. You want to be more productive? You need to meditate on the Word of God. That's a habit. Whose leaf does not wither. What does that mean? It means when the heat's on, when you're under pressure, you don't dry up because you've got deep roots. And the third part of the promise says this, and whatever he does prospers. Wow, that's Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Did you hear the premise and did you hear the promises? God wants to prosper you in what you do. But here's the premise. He says, you got to get into my word. You got to study it. You got to meditate on it. You got to think about it. And, that, and you got to do it. That's the condition. That's the premise to the promise. It's not enough just to study the word. You have to do what it says. Jesus said it like this in John 15, you're my friends if you do what I command. The book of James says the same thing. It tells us how to do this. It says this, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What is the perfect law that gives freedom? It's the Bible. And continues to do this. In other words, it's a habit. It's habitual. The man who looks in the word of God and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, that's memorizing, but doing it, that's acting on it, he will be blessed in what he does. Now here's the fourth habit for spiritual health. It involves not your time, it involves your money. Over and over in scripture, the Bible says this, if I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to tithe my income. Now what in the world does that mean, tithe my income? It means that just like I give the first part of my day back to God, I give the first part of my money back to God. I, I, what I, 10 percent of what I give goes back to God. In other words, if I make 10 dollars, I, I give a dollar back to God. Why, why in the world would I do that? Why would God ask me to do that? Well, God obviously doesn't need my money, but he wants what it represents. He wants my heart. And the Bible says where your treasure is, your heart is. Now, I'll have more to say about that in our session on financial health. But the Bible says this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It's one of the great promises of the Bible. And if you're going through financially difficult times right now, if you're under stress about your money and your finances, if you are barely making ends meet, you need this promise. It's one of the habits for spiritual health. Malachi 3.10 says this. Bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. By the way, what's the storehouse? It's wherever you worship. You don't give your time to some charity. You don't give your tithe to uh, some uh, uh, you know, foundation. You bring your tithe to the house of worship as an act of worship. He says, test me in this. I want you to circle that. Test me. I call this the Pepsi challenge verse of the Bible. He says, here's the premise. And see, here's the promise, if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, he's saying, I dare you, see if I won't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. God says, we're going to play a little game. You give to me and I'm going to give to you and we're going to see who wins. Now, let me give you a personal example of this. I played this game with God for 35 years and I've lost every year. 
when Kay and I got married, we made a commitment as a couple. We said in this marriage, God gets paid first. We may be in debt to other people, but we're not going to be in debt to God. We're going to put him first in our time and first in our tithe. I may be late on payments to somebody else, but I'm not going to be late on payments to God. God says, you want my blessing and your finances put me first. So you know what we did? 35 years ago, actually now it's 38, we started tithing. And at the end of that first year, we raised our tithe from 10% to 11%. The next year, we raised our uh, our uh, second year of marriage to 12%. The third year of our marriage, we raised our tithe to 13%. Now, we weren't doing this to show off. In fact, I didn't tell anybody about it for over 30 years. And the Bible doesn't even teach that you have to increase it. I just thought, yeah, if tithing blesses me, I want to be super blessed, so I'm going to play this game and give more and more every year. I'm going to see if I can outgive God. I'm going to see if I can be more generous every year of my life. So we kept raising our giving, being more generous every year, every year raising it more. Now, I'll be honest with you, sometimes it was really tough. Sometimes the cupboard seemed pretty bare, and I'd go, Lord, I, I, I can't afford this. But then I thought, I can't afford not to, because I wanted God's blessing on what was going on in my life, even when I was out of work. And there was times when uh, I didn't have any income, and, and uh, what do you do when you don't have any income? You don't tithe. You only tithe on what you make. You don't tithe on what you don't make. But every year, year after year after year, we kept raising our giving, 15% to 16% to 18%. In the years I'd get a bonus, Kay and I would raise our giving 2 or 3%. In the years we were financially tight, maybe we'd just raise it a quarter of a percent. But even in those lean years, I wanted to be more generous each year than I was the year before. Now, we've been married 38 years. Last year, we raised our giving, again, 1% from 90 to 91 percent of our income. And so now we're more than reverse tithers. We give away 91 percent and live on 9 percent. And I don't even take a salary at Saddleback Church. And yet I live a very comfortable life. Now I'm not telling you this to brag about myself. I'm telling you this to brag about God, that you cannot outgive God. You know, I wrote a book called Purpose Driven Life. It became the best-selling book in American history, more than any other book except the Bible. Why do you think God did that? Why do you think God chose me? It's not because I'm a great writer that I know why. It's because God knew what I'd do with the money. He knew I wouldn't spend it on myself, that we would just give it away. After I wrote that book, I could have bought an island and retired and had people serve me uh, little glasses of iced tea with an umbrellas in them the rest of my life. <laughs> but the Bible says it's not about you. It's all about God. And I want to tell you, learning this habit, the habit of generosity, is as important as learning the habit of daily time with God and learning the habit of a quiet time with God, learning the habit of studying the Word of God. These are all important because I give God my tithe, my talent, my time. I give Him every area of my life. Now let's move on. Habit number five for spiritual health is this. It's a big one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must learn to love other believers. Remember when we started off, we said God says life's all about love? Well, God doesn't want you to just love him. He wants you to love other believers. Jesus said it like this. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't just love me. You have to love everybody in my family. Here's what he said in John 13. If you have love for one another, he's talking about other believers, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. He said, the mark of being a disciple is not that you just love God, it's that you love everybody else. It's not that you just love me, but that you love each other. This is the hallmark of being a follower of Jesus. It's not, it, it's not like people know you're a Christian by your bumper stickers. People will know you're a Christian by your little lapel pin. People will know you're a Christian by a, a t-shirt. No, God says, the proof that you are my disciple is that you practice the habit of loving every other believer. You love my family. You love the church of God. You love the family of God. You love the children of God. Have you ever heard anybody say this? Well, you know, uh, I love Jesus. I, I just don't like the church. Then they're not a disciple. Why? Because with all of its imperfections and all of its faults and all its faux pas and all of its failures, Jesus says the church matters. It's the family of God. It's the bride of Christ. Jesus died for the church. The church is his family. So if you don't love the church, let me just say this. You're not going to like heaven because that's all who's going to be there. 
So you better figure out how to learn other disciples. Now the Bible says this, if somebody says, I love God and they hate a Christian brother or sister, that person's a liar. <laughs> That's pretty clear. God says, I'm a liar. I'm a liar if I say I love God and I don't love other Christians. Because if we don't love people that we can see, the Bible says, how can we love God whom we have not seen? That's a passage in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Now, to be a disciple, you must love other people in the family of God. I want you to write this down, okay? Spiritual growth happens in community. Spiritual growth happens in a community. Not by myself, not by my lonely me. You cannot be a disciple by yourself. Did you hear that? You cannot be a disciple in isolation. You cannot be a follower of Christ without being in community because it's all about love. You'll never grow to spiritual maturity without a church family. You can get Bible knowledge, but you can't grow in love if you're not around other people. And in John 13, the Bible says, if you have love for one another, then everybody will know you're my disciples. Now circle that phrase, one another. Circle that phrase, one another. That phrase is used 58 times in the Bible. The Bible says we're to love one another, we're to uh, help one another, care for one another, we're to serve one another. The Bible says we're to encourage one another, we're to pray for one another, we're to greet one another, we're to support one another. The Bible says over and over again <coughs> that we are to care for each other. Now, we were put on this planet to learn to love. First, to learn to love God supremely and to learn to love each other practically. Now, you have to have a church family, you have to be in relationships with God's people in order to learn how to love. You're not gonna learn it sitting in a cave up in the mountains. Learning to love God and learning to love your neighbor as yourself are the two great commandments in the Bible. This is why being in a small group like you're in right now is absolutely essential to your spiritual health. You cannot grow without it, why? Because you can't love a crowd. Let me say that again, you can't love a crowd. Now you can worship with a crowd, you know, 100 people, 200 people, 1,000 people or more, you can worship in a crowd, but you can't love. You can't fellowship with a crowd. So you need a small group, and you need to be committed in love to a small group of other believers where you can love and encourage and support, and they can love and encourage and support you. Habit number six for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to learn to serve others unselfishly. Now, service is an important part of your spiritual health and development. Because God says to grow, it's not all taken in. You gotta be given back. You gotta use those muscles that God gives you. You gotta develop your strength. And God says if you wanna be the most important person in the room, then you need to take the last place in the room and be the servant of everybody. The way to be great is by service. You have to give your life away. Jesus said it like this, one of the most important verses in the Bible. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Now I want you to circle the words, serve and give. I came to serve and I came to give. In that verse, Jesus gives us the two primary purposes of life after worship. He says, I came to serve and to give. That defines the Christian life. The more you learn to serve and the more you learn to give, the more you're going to be like Jesus. And you know what? The happier you're going to be, the more fulfilled you're going to be, the healthier you're going to be, and the more blessed you're going to be. Because when you do that, God says, I'm going to pour out blessing on you. Now, why is this so important? Why is serving uh, such an important habit in spiritual growth? Because a lot of people go to church and they get fed and they get fed and they get fed, but they do no service at all. Because serving is like spiritual exercise. See, if all we do is feed, all we do is listen, we come to church, we hear great studies, or we, we listen to uh, preachers on the radio, turn on the radio, we listen to them, we go to a Bible study and we study there, we're always taking in, taking in, but we never actually do anything. It's like eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and never burning any calories. You're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and you get spiritually fat. And some people are so spiritually fat you got to roll them down the aisles at church 
And that's where we get the term holy rollers. <laughs> If you don't get spiritual exercise by serving others, there's no way you're going to develop spiritual muscle. And there's no way you're going to grow. And there's no way you're going to get the blessing of God in your life. That's habit number six, serving others. Now, finally, let me give you habit number seven for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must pass on the good news. In other words, what I've been given, I've got to give to other people. I've got to tell others the good news about Jesus. I got to tell others that there's a purpose for their life, that they, they can be forgiven, that their past can be forgiven, they can have a purpose for living, they can have a home in heaven. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this, take the teaching that you heard from me that I, I proclaimed in the presence of many witnesses, and I want you to entrust what you heard from me to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. Now, I want you to notice there are four generations in that verse. Paul says, God gave me the good news, and then Timothy, I pass it on to you. That's second generation. He said, now, Timothy, you're to pass it on to other people. That's third generation, who are reliable enough to pass it on to fourth generation. See, the fact is, you're going to heaven because somebody told you, and somebody told the somebody who told you, and somebody told the somebody who told the somebody who told you. Here's the question. Very important question. Is the chain going to break with you? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Or are you going to end the chain? Somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. Have you told anybody? This is the seventh spiritual habit. You see, Christianity is always one generation away from just dying. If you don't tell somebody, then who is going to tell them? You're dependent on somebody else. You are spiritually sterile if you haven't told anybody about Jesus. Jesus says to be a disciple, to grow, you got to pass on the good news. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said it like this, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to do the same thing I taught you to do, to obey all the commands, to all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, that, that was the premise, here's the promise, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Now Jesus says to be truly his disciple, you gotta be a disciple maker. In other words, you have gotta tell somebody else. You have gotta be willing to share your hope, share your faith, share your story with others. So let me challenge you with this. I want you to pray, Lord, help me to bring one person to you this year. I dare you to pray that prayer. God, help me to bring one person, not, not two, not 10, not 20, just one. Help me to bring one person to you this year. And you know what? If you start praying about your friends who don't know the Lord, and you say, God, I want to bring one friend to you this year, God will make it so easy. The reason why it's not easy is you're not praying about it. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. There's the promise and the premise. They'll come to Christ if you be willing to share the good news. You just plant the seed and God will make it grow. Now think about this. Can you imagine what it would be like to get to heaven one day and you have somebody walk up to you and say, you know, I want to thank you. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. You told me about Jesus and I am your friend forever. You see, if you can reach one person for Jesus, then you are doing what it takes to be a disciple. We're commanded to pass it on. Now, these are the seven habits for spiritual health. We're starting with your spirit. We're going to move on to the other six areas of your life in the sessions ahead. But let me close by saying this. If you really want to grow healthy spiritually, you want to be spiritually strong. You don't want to be a baby anymore. You're going to have to choose to grow. You're going to have to make some choices. You're going to have to develop some habits. Spiritual growth is not automatic. It is a choice. It's a daily choice, but it has eternal rewards. And what do you call something that you choose to do every day? You call it a habit. Now, you've got to say, I'm going to quit being a half-hearted, half-baked, semi-pro, 
casual Christian. I'm going to get serious about this. I'm going to grow up. And I want to be healthy in every area of my life, physically, spiritually, mentally, vocationally, financially. But it starts with my spirit. Let me ask you this. Do you intend to be a godly man? Do you intend to be a godly woman? Do you intend to be as spiritually healthy as you can? Well, it isn't going to happen unless you choose to develop these habits. You need to say this. I'm going to choose to love Jesus supremely. That's a habit. I'm going to choose to spend time with him daily. That's a habit. I'm going to read the word of God and I'm going to do his word every day. I'm going to tithe faithfully. I'm going to love other believers and be committed to my church and be committed to my small group and be committed to community. And I'm going to use whatever gifts and talents and abilities God has given me to serve other people. I'm not going to live for me. I'm going to live for others. And finally, whatever I learned, I'm going to pass on to others. I'm going to share the good news. These are the seven habits for healthy spiritual growth. Now, I want to close this session uh, by praying for you and then leading you in a prayer. So would you bow your heads right now? I'm going to lead you in prayer in just a minute, but go ahead and bow your head. and Let me talk to you for a second. Again, you cannot grow spiritually healthy if you're not spiritually alive. There is no growth without life. You can't grow in Christ if you don't know Christ. So maybe that's the starting point for you in this session. Maybe you've known about Jesus, but you don't know him. Maybe you've heard of him, but you don't have a relationship with him. The Bible says that if I'm not alive in Christ, then I'm spiritually dead. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Have you been born again? You say, well, I don't know if I have been or not. Well, let's settle that one right now. It's pretty easy. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never opened up your heart, you never invited him to come into your life, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that's going to be the most important prayer you've ever prayed in your life. It's going to change you from death to life, from old to new, from guilt to forgiveness, from no purpose to purpose, from hell to heaven, from darkness to light. This will be the most important prayer you've ever prayed. And as I pray these words, you can just pray them in your heart. You don't have to pray them aloud. Just say, as I say these words, say, me too, God, me, me too. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Just say that. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want you to forgive my sins, and I ask you to give me a fresh start. I want to be spiritually alive. Let's say that, me too, Lord. I want to be spiritually alive. I want to be spiritually healthy. And so I ask you, dear Lord, to help me develop these habits. I want to learn to love you supremely with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. And I want to learn to love other Christians in the family of God. And dear God, I, I want to continue in your teaching by learning and studying your word so I can be set free from the hang-ups that hold me back, worry and fear and anxiety and guilt and confusion. Say, dear God, I want to develop spiritual muscle by learning the habit of serving others. I want to learn to be generous with my money. And I want to pass on the good news. Help me to find one person that I can bring to you to become a part of your family this year. Now, Lord, I can't do these things on my own. I can't build these habits without your help and your strength. So Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I ask you to come into my life, put your spirit in me, and give me the power to do what you want me to do and what in my heart of hearts I want to be able to do. I want to grow healthy and become more like you by developing these habits. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. I'm glad you prayed. Here's the first thing you need to do. You need to tell somebody about it. Tell somebody, if you open your life to Christ for the first time, say, you know what, I, I followed Rick in that prayer. And let other people know about it so they can help you start growing. 
We're going to have a great time in this series, and we're going to look at seven different areas of your life that it all starts with your spiritual growth. Begin to practice these habits this week, and God will bless you, and I'll be praying for you.